everyone, welcome back to Hannah Worldwide and Friends, the podcast about living abroad. If you live abroad or you love to travel or you are interested in different countries and cultures, this podcast is for you. Also, if you always wanted to live abroad but you haven't found the courage yet, this podcast might inspire you. Just follow me on Instagram or hit the bell button in Spotify to get updated on new episodes. Listen to Hannah Worldwide and Friends on Spotify, Apple Podcast, or wherever you get your podcast. Hey everyone, please welcome with me Melissa Cox, who moved from the United States of America to New Zealand 10 years ago with her husband, four suitcases and two guitars. Melissa is a former journalist and non-profit writer who recently published her first book called So You Want to Move to New Zealand. Her book is a great guide for Americans who consider moving to New Zealand, but it is also very interesting for everyone who wants to move to Aotearoa or wants to learn something about both countries. I will highlight the link of the book later in the comment section below. Hi, Melissa. Hi, thanks for having me. Thank you so much for taking your time tonight to record this episode with me and to talk about your book. Yeah, I'm excited. It's Thanks for having me. I am really curious about certain aspects of the book, but I also wanted to tell you, I really felt certain aspects, like it was really relatable for me once I read it because I have been through some situations as well so I could totally feel certain emotions and the way you were writing it I could feel your frustration in the beginning of the book mm. how you felt when you were in America mm. and I really enjoyed the little jokes on the side as well to make it like a little bit of a light read and um, what I also found really cool was that You are not just showing the good sides of the country you moved to and you guide us through, but you also say, okay, every country has its dark sides and um, you compare it pretty nicely and you back it all up with facts as well so that people can at the end still make their own choice if they think they can deal with it or if they think it's too hard. So... Yeah, it was really nice. Oh, thank you. I, I, um, being trained as a journalist, I went to uh, university in America for journalism, and they drilled in us that your opinion doesn't matter. You know, my wow. my personal my personal experience matters, but yeah. my opinion does not. And so, um, I felt very strongly that whatever. Um, whatever context that I give in this book has to be backed up by citations and sources um, and facts. Yeah. So, um, and hard truths about both countries. So, yeah, I think that's good though, because there will always be people who will look into the facts more than anything. So you mixed it quite nicely because you still added your personal touch and your experience Because I'm not necessarily a fact person. I don't necessarily need to compare all these data to make decisions. Mm -hmm. But we know lots of people are needing this to actually be able to make a choice. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah. Melissa, could you just tell us what the reason for you was or what your motivations were to leave America and to actually decide to move to New Zealand? Yeah, absolutely. So I do go into this in the foreword of the book. So the kind of the first chapter of the book. Um, but basically, my husband and I, you know, we got married in our mid 20s. And we did what all good millennials should have done, which is go buy a house. Yeah. <laughs> um, and settle down and get married and get good jobs. And that quickly got derailed by the global financial crisis. And we had bought our house um, in August of 2007, which was right before the global financial crisis and the housing crash of America. And um, I, we quickly found out that our house lost a 
pretty significant amount of value, not nearly as bad as some people in other parts of the country like Florida. But we were held hostage by our banks. We were eventually we found out we were one of the people who got scammed by Wells Fargo. Um, but we didn't know it at the time. And yeah. I was just seeing things around me like my coworkers not getting maternity leave and having to like put their like three or four week old baby into daycare and yeah, you know, pumping milk at their desks while sobbing. Um, and just, you know, just a lot of like turbulence in the political landscape. But, you know, I didn't intend to leave America. We went to New Zealand for a fun trip. Um, you know, we were about to turn 30 years old and we were like, let's just go to New Zealand because, you know, it would be like one last fun trip as a married couple before we settled down and have kids. And then <laughs> halfway through the trip, not even halfway through, like five days into the trip, we were sitting on the beach in Kaikoura. And if people who are listening don't know, Kaikoura is um, about an about 90 minutes to two hours north of Christchurch on the Pacific side on the ocean. And you have these beautiful uh, mountains cascading down into the sea. And there's like baby seals everywhere. And it's just it's like something out of yeah. a, a movie. And um, I had learned a lot about New Zealand at that time. And um we were thinking about moving states. We lived in Maryland. Um, you know, we were we were living in Elkton, Maryland, which, you know, Maryland's a great state, but Elkton, Maryland is right up the street from Rising Sun, Maryland. And Rising Sun, Maryland is like the Ku Klux Klan capital of the East Coast. Now, I don't know if you know what the Ku Klux Klan is, but for those of you who don't know, they yeah. killed a bunch of black people and they're still around. They're white supremacists. And so we just we had this like really unsettled feeling that we didn't want to continue living in that area, but because of the housing situation, we couldn't sell our house. And so we were kind of trapped and we were thinking about moving to Denver, Colorado, which where we had lived before we were looking at Hawaii, but there were a lot of issues with Hawaii and with not being able to get a job um, unless you're like certified by the board of like of engineers. My husband's an engineer. And so when we came to New Zealand, we were like, oh, wow, they, they need engineers. <laughs> oh, wow, yeah. this place is amazing. Oh, wow, this place gives you, at the time, I think it was like four months maternity leave. Now it's six months maternity leave. Like, yeah. you know, oh, they're, they're like giving out visas like they're candy. Like, it's pretty easy, especially if you're under 30. And the, <laughs> this, just this like crazy, like cascade of events happened within one year of sitting on that Kaikoura beach, we were in New Zealand living. And, you know, I go into the book more in detail, but that's basically it. I never intended to move out of America, but New Zealand was, um, was a different kind of thing. He, my husband got a, a lottery visa. Yeah. So 5,000 people apply for it. And he was only one of like 300 who got it. And we really felt, and they give you six months to get in, into the country, and then they give you nine months to find a job. And if in that nine months you don't find a job, they say, okay, go back to America. And he found a job very easily. But it was just like, if we had gotten that, if he had gotten that lottery visa and we decided not to come, we would have stolen a lottery visa from somebody else in essence. You know, yeah. 5,000 people applied for it. Maybe it was somebody who needed to get out of their country badly for yeah. poverty reasons, political reasons, a better life reason. And I felt like we had to honor the visa that we were given. It was a golden ticket. And so yeah. we did. That's pretty awesome. Yeah, I'm I'm glad for you guys that it worked out so well, <laughs> especially when it's not 100% planned, but then mm. still end up being the right choice for you and your family. That's really good. Yeah. I mean, we we intended to stay here for two years to try it out. And, mm -hmm. I, and I go into this in the book that New Zealand, like everybody thinks that when they get to New Zealand, it's going to be this utopia yeah. and that they're going to be happy from the get go and they're never going to feel like they miss America. And if you go into that with your, with that expectation, you're going to be let down. And it's not always for everybody. I know plenty of Americans who move right back to America, trying yeah. out New Zealand, and it didn't work out for them. And there's no judgment. 
if it didn't work for you, that's fine. You know, and that's part of the reason why I wrote the book was because to take out some of that mystery, right? Some of that, yeah. some like not sugarcoating it. You need to know what you're getting yourself into when you move here. Yeah. So. Yeah, especially when you're not just on your own and you might have already family and you want to go over. It's not just about your own opinion or how you feel about it. it it's sometimes even more on the line. Mm -hmm. For me, for example, I did not set myself or I didn't even intend to stay here. Mm -hmm. I was just going with my working holiday visa and thought like I – I try something new and we'll see how it goes. And luckily I got a job and I happen to love the country. But you're right. Here are also things which are tough. And mm -hmm. I had a couple of times where I really wished I would have been closer to my family. And mm -hmm. it's not always just the beautiful country. It has the daily habits and they come. Mm -hmm. So I'm really glad you describe it so nicely in your book as well because it's not – as you say, just the paradise, it's life and life is not always great. Exactly. I agree with you 100%. Yeah. So that pretty much takes out already my next question, why you wrote a book about it. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's one part that you wanted to pretty much prepare other people for what's coming. Yeah. I mean, I didn't really go into this in the book. And I mean, it, it, to be honest, if I could be brutally honest the please the, the, the cat the catalyst for the book first of all like we got out we moved here before donald trump became president yeah and i don't think people and look if if they're if you're a listener right now and you're listening to me and you like donald trump that's fine like i i don't hold it against you at all i'll let you make up your own mind with the caveat that you should make up your own mind based on facts not just you know, what he tells you. <laughs> um, but, you know, what happened with the overturning of Roe versus Wade, which for your listeners who aren't familiar with it, basically in, I think it was July of 2022, um, the Supreme Court in America overturned Roe versus Wade, which kicked back to all 50 states, they could make the decision about if you could get an abortion or not. And look, yeah. if you're not, if you're, if you're a listener and you're like, I'm against abortion, fine. Okay, fine. Absolutely fine. The problem is that with abortion restriction comes miscarriage care restriction. And I am a miscarriage sufferer. I nearly died in the ER in Hawks Bay Hospital yeah. because I was miscarrying. And thank God there was no law standing between me and the doctors who were going to save my life. I was yeah. 11 weeks pregnant. I wanted the baby. So when I saw that Roe versus Wade was being over, what had been overturned in July of 2022, a couple months later, so I guess this is around September, October, November-ish of 2022, there was a deep dive. I think it's Radio New Zealand. RNZ, they did a 30-minute mini documentary where one of their reporters embedded with a medical recruiter from New Zealand. And the medical recruiter was going over to Texas, which has some of the most stringent abortion laws in the country. And they were recruiting doctors, OBGYNs, nurses, midwives to come to New Zealand. And people were leaving Yeah. And places like Oklahoma and Texas because they were getting death threats for simply providing care for women who needed abortion access. Not just because they wanted to get rid of their baby, but because their baby had serious medical deformalities and they needed to abort so that they could continue to be fertile and try again later. Or they were actively miscarrying and they were bleeding out and the doctors couldn't save them because or couldn't intervene until it was like on the cusp of them dying. And so now we have doctors, nurses, OBGYNs who are coming to New Zealand and they don't want to come here, but they don't have a choice. They feel like they don't have a future in medicine in America. And so there is a severe medical brain drain happening in America right now. And they're not all coming to New Zealand. A lot are going to Australia and Canada and the UK and other countries as well. 
But New Zealand is definitely actively recruiting medical staff from America, from red states mostly. When I saw that, I thought to myself, no one should have tears in their eyes when coming to New Zealand. Yeah. Why? Like people, these women, mostly, mostly female doctors were saying that they felt like they had no choice and that to save their family, to save their livelihood, their medical profession, and to uphold the Hippocratic Oath, which is do no harm, they had to leave America. And I have thought to myself, if there are so many people coming to, um, to New Zealand from America, I can help them. I can maybe not take the tears out of their eyes, but I can at least give them basics of this country, like how to pronounce Tereo, what are the 16 regions of New Zealand and where should you settle? Um, what is the culture like? You know, how do you afford to live in New Zealand when it's so expensive? Um, how do you find camaraderie among other Americans? Like all of these things, I, I just got inspired and I'm like, I have to help. If, yeah. if one person gets a benefit from this book who was apprehensive about, about coming to New Zealand and they they feel better about their choice of coming here because of the book. I've done my job. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing that and also for sharing your own story. Um, especially it must have been quite hard and especially in that time and then hearing what's going on in your home country, which you make it really clear as well. You love America. It's not that you mm -hmm. hate it. Mm -hmm. um, hearing all these bad news from mm -hmm. your own country um, must, must be quite tough and then going through it yourself knowing that you got help but other people won't or the doctors nurses are in that conflict that they want to help but they are not allowed anymore mm -hmm. uh, that is weighing quite heavily on people so mm -hmm. um yeah thank you for sharing that oh it's all good I, th I think there's not enough to talk about miscarriage as well you know we hide it I think yeah. that, needs, that that stigma still exists. So, you know, if you're listening to this out there, you know, and if you're a doctor, nurse, OBGYN, whatever, you know, thank you for what you're doing, because I especially if you're in a red state, because it's not easy. Yeah, thank you. In the book, you have one section as well, which is like asking yourself certain questions before you make a decision mm. so for example you have why do i want to leave my current country or what sacrifices am i willing to make mm. and obviously as you mentioned just before people have completely different reasons why they would leave some people have no choice or feel like they have no choice mm. but um have you asked yourself all these questions you wrote in the book before as well before you made the decision Or was it more afterwards, once you moved and you settled, that you thought, I think these would be really good questions to ask yourself before making a decision? Um, so the questions that I pose in the book were in hindsight, but I will say that we were my husband and I were making this decision together. And so I could not make it unilaterally. I had to make it with him. And we went back and forth for months. At one point, we actually canceled our trip. I, I you know, talk about this in the book because I figured out that my cat would have cost me over $4,000 to get into the country. And I felt that she was too old and too frail to be able to live through the quarantine process. Um, and so, you know, I, we were actively asking each other, my husband and I, these questions and challenging each other challenging ourselves and when we canceled the trip because of my cat it took me two weeks to come to my senses I, f I found myself crying at my desk at work r looking at pictures of New Zealand realizing that I had made the wrong decision and so I went back to my husband and I said I don't think we should cancel the move we still have three months to get our butts in gear before your visa your lottery visa expires let's find a place to put my cat and just do it yeah And once we had made that decision to do it, knowing all the sacrifices, knowing what we were putting on the line, knowing the logistics of moving, um, it became very clear. And by that point, we were everything fell like a domino effect. We just felt really good about it. Yeah. Um, you have to follow your gut. It's really important in this process. And you ask those questions. We made a decision not to come. 
And then two weeks later, I knew it was the wrong decision. I had to feel it in my bones. And my husband felt the same way. Yeah. But we were we were kind of tricking ourselves. We were psyching ourselves out thinking that what we were, you know, you, you have to really communicate. And it wasn't easy. We had fights. We were crying a lot. We were crying. You know, we had crying with our families. We were fighting our families who were telling us we were naive. We were silly to go. Yeah. Um, all that outside doubt, um, all that outside negativity. So, you know, I do talk about it in the book because it's a huge aspect of what you're doing. The other thing that I will say is I didn't really put this in the book, but you know, there are a lot of Americans that I know who they don't come here permanently. Like they don't come here saying, I'm going to live here till I die. Yeah. They come here and they're like, even with kids and they're like, we're here for a year or two. Yeah. Kind of like an overseas experience. And as long as you've got a work visa that allows you to do that and you can enroll your kids in school, then I don't see any reason. Some like you, you said you came for a year and it ended up being five. Yeah. You know, we came with the idea of let's try it for two years. Well, now two years has turned into 10 years. Some <laughs> some people come here with the idea that they're going to live here till they die. And then they go back in three years because it's not for them. Yeah. So you have to be able to go with go with the flow. You yeah. know? Absolutely. Yeah, I totally agree. And I think if you really make really strong plans, mm. it might not go according to the plan and mm. then you might be disappointed. But mm. if you really just see how long you will actually be willing to stay and to fight because it's not always easy. Mm -hmm. And like I get the question all the time from my family and friends and they ask, are you going to stay there now forever? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm just always like, I don't know. I mm. still love the country. I still really enjoy it here. Mm. But I have talked to, to a couple of people who really liked it here too. And then at one point they decided, I think now after 20 years, I think I'm now ready to go back home or closer to my family. Mm -hmm. So you never really know. And it's good to listen to your feeling. Mm -hmm. and as you said just go with the flow as long as it's good and you make the right decision and it's your gut which is pretty much telling you what to do mm -hmm. you mentioned um your family as well that there were fights and you also describe really good in the book that there's a lot of guilt coming with that decision of moving and um you describe it quite well How is the relationship with your family now? And how, or first of all, how was it to leave them behind? And then how is the relationship now? Um, so leaving was hard on them. On So, you know, I have, I have parents, my husband has parents, and we have two siblings each. I've got two sisters. My husband has a brother and a sister. Um, it's a bit different on both sides. My husband's father was in the military and they moved around a lot. And his brother and sister, my husband's brother and sister live in completely separate states that are very far to get to. So everyone's kind of scattered anyway. Yeah. And, you know, my in-laws, my mother and father-in-law, they brought up my husband when he was growing up. They lived in like Italy in like seven or eight different states. They were never in the same place for more than three years. Yeah. And so for them, they kind of gave us a little bit of grief. And then I said, well, how is it any different for me if you guys got to live in like Italy and like, yeah. you know, I think, they lived, I think they lived in like Jamaica at one point before you know <laughs> my husband was born. And then like they lived in these mo most beautiful places in like different parts of the country. And then also like you know, kind of a middle America, like where it takes 45 minutes to get to the nearest grocery store. So they had this amazing experience. And I'm like, I want to do that. It's my turn now. And they're, yeah. they kind of realized that I was right. My, <laughs> and they were really supportive and they still are. My parents, they've, you know, my mom lived in like two states growing up, but they've been living in, in the same spot in Delaware for my whole life. My dad was born and raised in Delaware. He's never left. And so I think it was a little bit harder for them to wrap it, wrap their heads around. Yeah. But I think what's important is just 
I, I lay it out in the book. Like you'd never, I made the mistake of always getting defensive. Yeah. And I think you just got to stick to the script. If you're trying to talk to your loved ones, like, I know you love us. I know this is hurting you. I understand, but I have to do what's right for me. And especially if you were like me, where you were looking around going, nobody's getting maternity leave around here. There's guns in schools. Yeah. Um, you know, the politics is getting a little crazy. At the time, it was the Obama years. Um, and so it was sort of like, I'm like, mm, no, you know. And and so when I, you know, I should have more calmly said to my family, look, this is these are the reasons. But they know they know now. So, yeah. Um, and and they're they're supportive of it. They They've all come here before. So they once they look around at New Zealand and they understand New Zealand's culture and the laws and the benefits you get here, they they kind of get figured it. out why. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So and then the pandemic all- hit. <laughs> Yeah. And then how many times did I hear, oh my God, you're so lucky you're in New Zealand right now? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's true. I have heard a couple of times as well. Oh, maybe it's not too bad that I'm so far away. Mm. Um, yeah, it's crazy. Like what's going on in the world? Sometimes it does feel a little bit safer in New Zealand. Mm. Um, so, especially with me in Germany, um, in Europe with the Ukraine war yeah. and Russia. Yeah. Um, I think everyone is also like, oh, maybe it's good to be far away. <laughs> yeah. Although that can always change. I mean, the new yep. the new thing is the issue with China, and we have we're very close proximity to China, and that's going to be a concern. So you know, anything can change. Yeah. I'm just glad I have two passports now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just recently got my permanent resident visa. Congratulations! Thank you. Actually, last week. So. Awesome. Fresh. <laughs> a little party, eat a little cake, have a little drink. <laughs> yeah, usually we go out for nice food. <laughs> Good idea. So when you think about your family and you think, okay, now they are supportive, they kind of understand every one of us, and you also mention it in the book, has homesickness. You mm. can't help yourself but sometimes miss the country miss the convenience and of course miss the loved ones and um i i had one section from the book which i even quoted it says if you aren't willing to sacrifice time with your loved ones then perhaps a move to new zealand is not for you or maybe it is and you have to figure out a way to make both work and <laughs> I I felt this part specifically because this is something I think a lot about recently. I love mm. the country. I want to stay. I want to make it work. But I do miss my family so much. And I talk to my friends over there all the time. And I would love to build new memories with them, which means you need to be close to them or at least spend some time with them, which is obviously quite difficult being so far away. Mm -hmm. And then I really feel that homesickness. And so what are you doing when you really feel it? Uh, um, So short-term homesickness, um, just go and find the nearest Mexican restaurant. (laughs) (laughs) Um, or, or, you know, uh, you know, I mean, I don't know, short term, you know, I've, I've made a lot of American friends here. And so we can all share, you know, our, we can empathize with each other and talk about it. And because you're around other Americans, we tend to be quite like loud. (laughs) And, you know, if you're, if, you know, you can hang around with other loud Americans and no one is going to get annoyed You know, um, long term, you know, it pre pandemic, we used to go either go back to America every year to visit or we would meet halfway with people in Hawaii and we would all splurge and get a big house on the water. Um, That's something we did um, with my husband's family. Um, Or we we kind of coax and beg our family and friends to come out here and visit us and they have and that's great and um so now you know what 
when I do say in the book, like, or figure out a way that, bo- you know, you can get best of both worlds, you know, remote work is getting really popular. Yeah. And if you, I kind of, I kind of, you know, back, back in the 50s, 60s, 70s, the, the kind of the old way of doing work was you get a job and it doesn't matter how much you hate it. You just get that job, especially in America, because that's how you got health care. And um, and you get your retirement, you get your pension when there were pensions yeah. and you and then you retire and you play golf all day and you play with your grandkids and you drink wine and you eat good food and you retire yeah. and and you put in the hard work and i think they're doing a you know they're they're kind of struggling with this in france right with the um retirement age getting high pushed, high. pushed yeah. up and people are like rioting in the streets yeah. america america would never riot in the streets they'd be like oh okay um <laughs> so so the thing is with me i'm like well with remote work now i kind of i think a lot of millennials and you know, Gen Z people and people who are like in the next generations are less yeah. likely to choose a job um, for quote unquote stability. What they want is flexibility. Yeah. And so, you know, I'm going to take a job that gives me flexibility. It might pay $20,000 or $30,000 less, but it'll allow me to work remotely and I can go to America whenever I want or go to New Zealand whenever I want. Or I, you know, there's another podcast that I listen to and she bounces between like countries in Latin America, Costa Rica. Of course that has to be something that a, your visa allows you to do and B you have to be careful of um, like the residency requirements where you're not like overstaying in a certain country because then you could be double taxed and you know, you got to be careful of that, but yeah. you know, that's something to consider. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, but homesickness, just trying to get back as much as possible. Uh, you know, we have a, with the pandemic, we couldn't. Yeah. Um, as soon as the borders opened, I was on the first flight back to America. <laughs> um, I truly was like, okay, borders open in July. I'm going back in August for a month. Nice. Ne- you know, next year, um, because I, cause I can work remotely. I'm like an audio engineer and I do some other music stuff on the side. So my goal is to go back to America next May and June for eight weeks. Oh, so, that sounds amazing. <laughs> yeah, but I'm going to be making money during the time. You know, my husband, if he can work remotely, at you know, we're going to try to negotiate it or at least take some unpaid time off or just, you know, do something. But, you know, companies are more open to this as long as you get your work done, you know, and I, yeah. I think that that's something to consider. Yeah, I think uh, that's a really great point to bring up as well. I remember when I left my permanent job back home in Germany, one person, she wasn't our generation, not millennial or Gen Z. Yeah. Um, and she was like, oh, I don't know if it's so good to give up your permanent job. And I was like, oh, that's really the worst advice you could give me because I'm pretty sure – nowadays people are not staying for 50 years in the same job anymore and as you said now we are looking because everything is stable in a way we are looking for flexibility and with the quote in your book which I just read out loud before that's pretty much my priority now finding Mm -hmm. a way to either be more remote or to make so much money that I can afford going which mm-hmm. you might know in New Zealand depends on the area you work mm-hmm. in. Mm-hmm. Or I find a job which is in connection with my home country, for example. So I'm actually also looking into how can I make it work to actually mm-hmm. see them more often, but still enjoy staying in this country. So I totally agree on that. And um, you also mentioned the age goes up with like working hard and America would never riot in the streets. (laughs) So (laughs) you described so good in the book how you got brought up, like you are a hard worker, you start early, you stay late, you don't get paid for it and you're proud of it. Where do you think that kind of idea of work ethic was coming from? And when did you realize, okay, I think my mental health and work-life balance and all these factors are actually more important? 
I mean, for me personally, it was my parents that brought me up that way. Um, if I got anything less than an A or a B uh, in in my studies, I was in trouble. So if I got a C, it wasn't good enough for them. Oh. Um, and, you know, f- fair enough. But I was always an overachiever. Um, and I, I started reading at a very early age. But, you know, I was also teased and bullied at school. And so I was, in order to avoid that, I threw myself into my academics because I, if I could be the teacher's, not the teacher's pet, but if I was like a good student, then my yeah. teachers would protect me a little bit. And I just, I didn't, I wasn't in the social circles that would keep me from studying. So that's where right up until I was about 12 or 13 years old, I had no social life. And so I was basically <laughs> like always reading, always studying, um, always doing extracurricular activities like, um, you know, dance, tennis, you know, I was just, my parents were like, yeah. do, 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 always doing something, reading something. And so that's where it came from. Yeah. Um, overarchingly, you will probably see that in America, it's that whole sort of like, you got to fight for the American dream. You have to pull yourself up by your bootstraps. You only get ahead if you work hard. I mean, that is like in every single political stump speech behind a podium by every single politician on the planet. If you work hard and you pull yourself up by your bootstraps, you can have the American dream if you just work hard. That is in every single political speech you'll probably ever hear in some way, shape or form. And it gets drilled into you from like day one of being an American. And I've heard this anecdote and I don't know if it's true, but John Lennon, you know, the Beatle, yeah. um, he said he was asked when he was in grade school, what do you want to be when you grow up? And he said, I want to be happy. Yeah. And whoever asked him that, I guess it was a teacher maybe, said, no, 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 you don't understand the question. And John Lennon said back to them, yeah, I understand the question. You don't understand life. <laughs> no, I don't know if that's true if he said it, but you know what? Even if he didn't say it, isn't that an interesting concept, right? Yeah. Never dawned on me as a child that if somebody asked me, what do you want to be when you grow up? The answer would be, I want to be happy. Yeah. <laughs> um, or I want to be a good person and do good for other people. It's I want to be an astronaut. I you know, I want to be you know, a teacher. Successful in a way. Yeah. Yeah. I want to be rich. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, and so I thought that that is, that is the quintessential America. What do you want to be when you grow up? I want to be rich. I want to be an astronaut. You know, I want to be an inventor. And those are all good things. I want to be yeah. a doctor. I want to be a nurse. I want to be a teacher. Those are all really, really good things. I'm not bashing it. Yeah. Problem is that when you work your butt off and you do all that and you still get screwed by the system, that's a huge problem. Yeah. I was pretty impressed because, as I mentioned, I learned also quite a bit about America, which I didn't know before with the book <laughs> and yeah. with the laws as well, that there is not really a set amount of annual leave or Correct. anything like that. That was really shocking. And also the fact you describe in the beginning that – Instead of like since they had the new law about the health care, mm-hmm. instead of actually paying for health care, they decided to go down with the hours yeah. so that they did not have to pay. I was really shocked, like really, really shocked and still speechless that there is so little protection for the people, to be honest. And mm-hmm. coming from a country where I had 30 days of annual leave, And oh, that's I'm, really good. Oh, yep. Yeah. And now I'm I'm complaining here that New Zealand has only 20. I I feel quite guilty. <laughs> so hearing from other countries, oh, it, it don't feel guilty. <laughs> I mean, it's fine. <laughs> yeah. So um, I, I will t- I will tell you that you know I will say that you know well uh, it. I think for people listening, you might be like, well, wait a minute, I work in America and I have two weeks vacation or I have three weeks vacation. That is solely the company's thing like that. That is the company's decision. Yeah. Um, but there are no federal mandated protections for, for annual leave. Yeah. Zero. 
Um, and so if, if a company decides that they're not going to give you vacation, um, then they don't have to give it to you. I think probably the most egregious example I heard of is I have a friend named John. His mom worked for this company for like 40 years or something. And she was nearing retirement age. She was like getting up there, like 63 years old. She was getting very close to retiring. Yeah. Her company, she worked there for 40 years. And she I think she got like four weeks vacation. And she got like she had a really good salary. But that's yeah. because she was a senior worker. Yeah. And she worked her way up, right? So that's the American dream. You work yeah. hard, you stay loyal to a company, you get more vacation time, you get more money. Great. Yeah. Her company got bought out by another company. And they said, if you want to keep working here, you have to sign a new contract with us. It was going to be a deep pay cut, and they were going to kick her back to two weeks of vacation a year. So she lost two of her four vacation weeks. And wow. she was, I don't remember what happened if she left in protest, if she retired early, if she took a severance, or if she like stuck it out for the next year and a half until she turned 64 and a half. I can't remember, but yeah. I remember my friend being really angry for her because it's his mom. Yeah. And I'm like, that's just one example of many that I won't go into, that many yeah. that I have heard of personally. And I'm sure, you know people listening to this now you have friends or family or you you yourself have suffered something like that yeah. that's the problem is that you work hard and then they shut they pull the rug out from under you and you have no recourse yeah so that's that's the fact where i'm like wow there's literally no security no safety and Correct. if they can just do whatever then what's the point in even signing contracts if they can just change it anytime <laughs> yeah <that's correct. laughs> correct <laughs> yeah wow um so yeah i think um all these examples probably helped you understand okay that's not necessarily the right thing to do and then maybe the question of what actually means being happy in life came slowly into the picture <laughs> yeah i mean i think the i, I think The thing that really sold it for me with New Zealand was I remember on our first vacation here in New Zealand, on our first holiday here, you know, we hadn't decided to move here yet, although it was kind of in my brain, but I was kind of pushing it back. And we were like swimming under a waterfall on the South Island somewhere. Wow. And there was, I think that, I think the guy was Italian and he had been living in New Zealand and I think he was an electrician and he had been living in New Zealand for several years by that point. So he was an immigrant. Yeah. And I remember talking to him and he was like, we were just chatting as we were like sunbathing, getting out of the water and it was a beautiful day. And he goes, you know, you can't sue anybody here. <laughs> and I go, what? And he goes, you can't sue anybody here. There's something called the ACC. And I'm like, what does that mean? Because it means that you can't sue anybody here. But if you get in an accident, they'll cover your health care, like your physical therapy, your surgery, whatever you need. And they'll cover your salary up to a certain amount while you recuperate. And I went, no, that's not real. <laughs> that can't be real. Too good to be true. That can't be real. And um, it was real. And I wrote, I write about the ACC extensively in the book for anyone who's interested. New Zealand is the only country in the world to have passed tort reform back in the late 1970s. It replaced the right to sue with the... ACC. And so now this was sticking out in my mind at the time because my sister in America stopped at a stop sign while she was driving. Someone rear-ended her and she got the police involved because in America, when you get in an accident, you have to call the police because yeah. it's considered a scene of a crime. And she called the police and they said, well, these people rear-ended you, so they're going to swap insurance information and they'll get back to you. Well, she never heard from them, but it wasn't like her car was really that damaged. Yeah. So she let it go. Eleven months later, she got sued by the people that rear-ended her. What? <laughs> yeah. From like a shysty lawyer, like just some like small claims lawyer. And they took her to court and they they claimed that she, they had that she had caused them physical and emotional distress because she didn't go through the intersection at the stop sign fast enough and it was her fault that they had rear-ended her and the judge 
The judge took one look at it and was like, no, we're going to throw this case out. Case dismissed. Yeah. We're not, you know, m- my sister won. But did she win? No, because she still had to pay like a thousand dollars or something for a lawyer to protect herself. That's and they ridiculous. didn't have any. They just were trying to extort money out of her. Yeah. And that would. So here's the thing. That would never, ever happen here. Yes, you can go to tribunal. Yeah. But you, I don't think you hire any lawyers. And I think it, the losing party has to pay certain fees involved with the tribunal. Um, Doesn't mean that, like, you can get away with murder. It doesn't mean <laughs> that, like, you can just break the law because, you know, and it doesn't mean you can create, you know, do medical malpractice. You can bring a case yeah. in that case. But for the most part, you don't like you don't have to constantly be looking over your shoulder. Yeah. Um, and to be honest, everyone knows the reputation about America suing people or companies constantly for the tiniest thing or for the most ridiculous things like that's what we all kind of know so yep hey they made a whole show about it it's called better call Saul I mean they made a whole show about it right my my partner actually watches that (laughs) great show (laughs) Oh. oh god yeah coming coming back to these um America New Zealand comparisons There are a lot of disadvantages also um, as an American living overseas, not just in New Zealand and other countries too, but since you have experienced the New Zealand story, for example, with the banks, which is like the fat (laughs) cat called, which you can also explain if you want, or like the taxes and the Kiwi saver. Mm -hmm. Um, So it comes with quite an uncertainty when it comes to the future as well, like generally and financially. So have you ever worried much or what is your thought on how do you feel about it? How is it impacting your thoughts on your future? So, yeah, so so I can just tell you for your listeners If you're an American and you move overseas, you need to understand that you have to file your taxes with the IRS. And if you don't, you can get in big trouble. There are a lot of American expats or American immigrants living overseas who don't realize this. And then they have to go through a long, painstaking process of doing back tax filing through a streamed line process. And it takes a long time and it's expensive. So the reason, another reason why I wrote this book is I can't tell you how many Americans living in New Zealand or just overseas in general didn't realize this and they are in deep, deep trouble. Um, and so, um, or they didn't realize it in a year or two and they're scrambling to get their stuff in order. So what I would say is personally for me, you know, knowledge is power and I don't worry about the future because there are some options out there for uh, for me as an expat and that's part of my research for this book i've uncovered options i've also armed myself with knowledge um about like where can i save for retirement without being double taxed or punitively taxed where can i open up a bank account without the bank closing it on me because i'm an expat where can i what are my limits in terms of like opening an LLC in New Zealand or starting a partnership in New Zealand as an American citizen? Uh, what are the downfalls of KiwiSaver? And this is a big one for anyone who's moving to New Zealand, especially with kids. I highly recommend buying my book if for anything at all, just the chapter on banking and taxes, because yeah. you can end up costing yourself thousands of dollars a year if you're not careful. Now, listen, (laughs) I'm I'm not a CPA. I'm not an accountant. I am not a tax person. So I'm, I'm very clear in the book that with all the disclaimers, I am not a tax accountant. However, from a journalistic standpoint, I cite everything. And then I recommend that you get yourself an expat CPA. So that for me, I don't worry about the future because I've done my homework. Where I worry is people who don't know what they're getting themselves into and yeah. then as an American and then later they find out too late and there are plenty of examples of that. Um, 
So, yeah. And I also lean really heavily on the expat community. So there's like two Facebook groups called Americans in New Zealand and Americans in Aotearoa slash New Zealand. They're Facebook groups that you can join and they're well moderated. It's There's like no politics allowed. It's just basically like questions that you can pose to the group and you can also like go to fun events that people have for Americans around New Zealand. Yeah. Um, you know, when the World Cup came, like all the Americans were taking pictures and selfies and putting it up there of them in the stands. So it's a nice little community. <laughs> um, you know, so that that is another thing um, to consider. It is very for, for your non-American listeners. Um, you guys are probably like, you know, because you're from Germany, I assume you're not being you're not you don't have to file in Germany if you're not a resident. Right. No. Like when I'm here. Well, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just I pay tax in one country only. Yeah. So So I still pay tax in well as a sole trader or as a sole proprietor, I pay tax in both countries. My husband, <laughs> he does he pays he makes way more money than me. Ironically, he doesn't pay any tax to America, but that doesn't change the fact that we still have to file. Yeah. And we still have to hire a CPA and that CPA costs us roughly 500 New Zealand dollars every year to hire to do our taxes for us. And they're not easy taxes. I'm talking like 50 pages long yeah. for America. So, wow. yeah. So America is only one of three countries on the planet that taxes its non-resident citizens. The U.S. is one of them. North Korea is another. And Eritrea, which is a dictatorship in Africa also does the same and it's a way for them to keep tabs on their citizens abroad and we don't yeah. really keep good company when america is in there with eritrea and north korea nah. <laughs> that not does a, not sound good not a good look no. they are there there are expat communities around the world not just in new zealand lobbying congress to try to get them to change some of the rules around this yeah. i don't know if it'll ever happen but they're trying yeah as we have seen, it's really difficult in America to actually change the laws or to get people to, yeah, push yeah. it through. So yep, we will see. And I just recently um, read the book of Michelle Obama as well. And she sometimes yeah. shines the light on certain political aspects as well. So mm. that was also very insightful. So oh, I haven't read that yet. I'm going to have to read that, though. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. Awesome. Um. Yeah, but crazy. But I'm glad that you at least um, know what you're doing and what you're talking about. And I also can highly recommend for everyone who's listening and interested to buy the book and read it and get some information, especially even if someone is interested in moving to New Zealand but is not from America. Yeah, I would say that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, lots of facts about New Zealand, which are good for everyone to know about so yeah i think one of the reasons why i wrote the book the way that i did for americans though is i i did debate writing a book about new zealand yeah from an expat through an expat lens or through an immigrant lens and i immediately realized that was not a good idea because your personal immigrant experience in any country is going to be heavily influenced by the country that you were born in or came from. Yeah. And um, Louisa May Alcott, who wrote Little Women, she said, write what you know. Yeah. Well, I don't know what it's like to be an immigrant from India living in New Zealand. I don't know. I'm not I'm not from India, you know, yeah. so I can't I, I didn't want to um, I didn't want to overgeneralize um, and say that. New Zealand's going to be the same for everybody because I say in the beginning, I'm a white, affluent yeah. American woman, um, cis female. And, you know, I don't have the same experiences as, as someone who is black or brown or bisexual or gay or transgender. And so yeah. I'm very careful about that. But I will say that, you know, if you're thinking about coming to New Zealand, if you're not from America, you'll still get a lot out of this book. If you are... Um, if you're just if you're from America and you're not planning on living in New Zealand, but you're just planning on coming here for like a month or a couple of weeks to like, you know, camper van around the country, yeah, it's it's also helpful. Yeah, 
I will definitely say, because especially the first time you order coffee in this country, you're going to be confused. <laughs> yeah, I enjoyed that part. <laughs> it was yeah. definitely one of the, my more embarrassing moments. <laughs> <laughs> but also I found it really funny that you brought up some Tereo words, um, especially, or not just Tereo, but also like slang, language, um, little things, which I haven't even noticed now after five years that they are pretty much Kiwi. Um, <laughs> I mean, the sweet ass is definitely the main thing I needed to get used to in the beginning because I, I wasn't really sure how to take that. <laughs> but um, yeah. even the little things that people say no problem or no worries, I didn't notice anymore. So when I read your book, I actually was like, oh, yeah, I would never say no worries. But since I'm here, it's like such a common thing. So mm -hmm. definitely helpful. Yeah, um, yeah, absolutely. It's good to know what people are saying to you when, you know, so if you're coming to visit New Zealand, you pick up the book because I haven't seen it. I, I haven't read that many tourism books about New Zealand, but for the ones that I have, they don't really go into the lingo. Yeah. <laughs> um, and like, I mean, maybe there are some books out there that do, but the tourism books are more like where you should go see the best waterfall or where you should see cool Maori carvings or yeah. what town towns to get the best white bait fritter. Um, excursions etc but they don't really go into like the vernacular like the the lingo and when you come here and you're an american as a tourist people are saying stuff to you and you have to like figure it out really quickly and some of it doesn't <laughs> sound some of it doesn't sound appropriate <laughs> yeah yeah that's true <laughs> Yeah. And what I've also realized, because I have an American friend at work as well, and we work now closely together, we have, since we she's from America, I'm from Germany, and we are working closely with like seasons. And for us now, summer, spring, autumn, winter, everything is just completely upside down. And mm -hmm. we are getting completely confused if someone says the spring season what it actually means and <laughs> the autumn we are completely out so we really write it down and I'm like okay this is spring here this is autumn <laughs> yeah so completely yeah opposite. little <laughs> little differences which you don't really think about when you're not going over um Is there anything you feel like you would have loved to know before you moved to New Zealand? Yeah, actually, I so I, I thought about this question. Um, <laughs> um, I think, I think, uh, I mean, if I, I could be blatantly honest, I think just, in the very first two years, I, I'm a very outgoing person and I'm very loud. <laughs> and um, and now I'm not so much anymore because for 10 years I've been here. And that didn't sit well with a lot of Kiwis I met. Oh. Too loud. And yeah. they don't, um, they will tell you. And sometimes they can be quite vindictive. And you know, uh, I have seen some Americans say I'm going to be loud and proud American and that's all good. But at the same time, it's like when in Rome, do what the Romans yeah. do. Right. And so, you know, I've assimilated over time. So I, I would say that if I had, if I, I wish someone would have pulled me aside before I went to New Zealand and they would, they would have told me like, you need to tone it down. <laughs> and I say, I say it in the book. I, but when, yeah. when I'm around my American friends, I go right back to being loud. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that's fine, you know. Yeah. Um, and I'm not saying that all Kiwis are reserved either because I'm a music teacher part time and there's a couple of music teachers that I work with who are loud as <laughs> and I love them. They're so mm -hmm. fun, you know. So I'm not saying that all Kiwis are like that because um, I also try to stay away from generalities and stereotypes in the book. Yeah. Because that'll get you a lot of hate mail, so <laughs> <laughs> which we don't um, want. <laughs> no, no, we don't want that. So, so yeah. But I mean, more or less, that's what I would have. Um, also, the, just this the coffee situation would have been nice to know, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. 
For me as a non-coffee drinker, I think I haven't noticed it that much. But of course, if someone comes over and is used to a different type of coffee, then that's quite a culture shock. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> is there anything else you would like to share with us today before we end the episode with our quick three questions? Um. No, I just I you know it's it's nice to talk to you as a fellow immigrant and yeah. Um I think, you know, I mean buy the book. <laughs> I mean, so uh, it's a, it's an ebook only cuz to print books these days is astronomically expensive. So, you know, um I you know, I have um if you go to usa2nz.com so I just got a new domain name. <laughs> so it's, it's USA two, not the number two, like T O USA two N Z dot com. If you go there, you get um you get the book at a discounted rate. I think it's like forty percent off the Amazon price. Yeah, I That's would like definitely link it in the comment okay. section so cool. that everyone is able to access okay. it. Um, make sure that that actually is the URL because I just bought it yesterday. <laughs> yeah. USA2NZ.com. Yeah. And so, you know, it's, it's like, I think it's like less than six bucks on there. So like, you know, totally worth it. If you're coming to live here, grab it. If you're coming here to visit for a few weeks, it's only six bucks. Grab it. Yeah. Like, it'll be helpful. Still get your tourism books to go because I don't really talk about tourism sites. Yeah. Because I figure there's a zillion books like that. So this is more like practical on the ground stuff. Um, like how to drive on the left side of the road. What the heck is a roundabout? Um, especially for Americans, what is this roundabout thing? Um, <laughs> we don't have them. Um, yeah, yeah, that's also interesting because we have roundabouts, but roundabouts here on the left side were tricky for me because I mm -hmm. always wanted to go in the wrong direction. Right. So definitely good to practice driving where it's safe. <laughs> definitely. And for Americans, it's like, we don't have roundabouts. And so it's like, Where yeah. are all the traffic lights? There are no four-way stop signs, like which is liberating. America, look, let me tell you, Americans, if there's one reason to move to New Zealand, it's so you never have to deal with a four-way stop sign situation ever again. <laughs> like, you just don't have to do it. <laughs> yeah, definitely has its perks. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, you've heard it. Please make sure if you're interested, go and grab the book, read it on your Kindle or wherever you can read it from. And um, yeah, I really enjoy having that conversation. It's really interesting for me also to learn about things in America since I'm not from America. And it was great for me to learn a couple more things about the country I chose to live in as well. So Today, we end our episode with the quick three questions, which means it's only one word or one sentence to kind of keep it Ooh, okay. intuitive. So number one, which country would have been your plan B? Mm. <laughs> um, still America? <laughs> <laughs> which is but fair enough. But, but, but a different part of America. Yeah. Because it's huge. Yeah, Hawaii, oh, Hawaii. Hawaii specifically. Nice. All right, question number two. What do you miss the most about your home country? The food. <laughs> the fatty fast food? No, 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 no. The me well, the, the melting pot of different foods. Yeah. It's cheaper. <laughs> yeah, definitely. That the portions are bigger. <laughs> and that you have a lot a lot more variety in the grocery store like you can you can choose anything organic you know you can just get it you yeah know? i miss that too, too yeah <laughs> or like so, so so you don't so do you go to the costco in, in auckland at all i went once but i didn't grow up with costco anyway so okay. for me it was like <laughs> if i have it or not but the variety in the supermarkets it's definitely a different thing like yeah. I can go and get pretty much everything and I can have like a soy yogurt for two euros so mm. I miss that too mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm with you on the soy yogurt 
Yeah. <laughs> All right. Last question. What do you love the most about New Zealand? Mm, uh, as a mom, the safety for my son. Yeah. Before I became a mom, I probably would have said the 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 non litigious nature of the country where you can't sue anybody <laughs> but but no, for now it's like the safety for my yeah. son it doesn't mean it's a hundred percent safe people don't don't misunderstand me there's still stuff that happens but not at the same level as America yeah thank you oh, it, thank you for having me thank you so much for your time and especially it's quite late already so i right. i do appreciate it and it was super nice talking to you also as you said as a fellow expert it's always nice to kind of connect and share your your experience and yeah thank you thanks appreciate so it. much yeah would you ever go to america to i i Have did you been? i did um Where did you i went go? I was in Miami, I was in New York, Boston, and Philadelphia, and Washington, so... Washington State or Washington, D.C.? What Washington, D.C. Okay, so those are my stomping grounds, that whole area. Yeah. Philly, Phil I used to work in Philadelphia, and then Washington, D.C., I have family and friends. No. Um, my, Miami is great, warm, yeah. yeah. Did you like it over there? I loved it, to be honest. I really miss it as well. I went to New York three times and I went for Christmas time over there. Oh. And beautiful. And yeah, I do miss it, I have to admit. Um, but also just for visiting because I can't really wrap my head around the laws about guns and I don't understand it. I don't, for me, it's normal to not be allowed to have a gun. So I, I don't really know. As a tourist, you don't really feel that whole safety issue. But right, right, right. Mm. I, I, I still would love to see um, the. I went to the East Coast, so I would love to see the West Coast one day. Mm. So still would come back as a visitor for sure. <laughs> Definitely. Well, it's there's lots to see. It's a huge country. So one hundred percent, and also South America. Even though mm. the safety part is also not quite a given, but beautiful mm -hmm. nature um yeah i would love to go one day so it's on the list <laughs> awesome sounds good thank you so much and um i hope everyone who was listening enjoyed it and please go get the book if you're interested and bye bye, bye.